I think you all got a packet, and I want to invite you to look in your packet and take this out, if you would, and you need a pencil or a pen. <clears throat> so my part is to, again, talk about, the nervous, about trauma and the nervous system. And what happens in our body. So this sheet, it's, this, this sheet is related to the very first skill that there is in when we're working from a nervous system perspective, and it's called notice and name. And for some people, this is going to be challenging. Because what I'm inviting you to do is to take a moment, check in with your body, check in with your nervous system, and notice <clears throat> what state, what the energy is in your system at the moment. Do you feel engaged, present, more relaxed than not, more safe than not, which is the upper end of this, the ventral? That's this upper one. You don't, okay, all you need to do is draw uh, X and Y axis. And if my life counted, depended on it, I could not tell you which is the X and which is the Y. But you just want to draw that. And you can make three boxes, on the, like on the side there. The top one is ventral, which is safe and connected. The next one is sympathetic, mobilized, fight, flight. And the last one is dorsal, immobilized. You don't have to write all that. You just, you got these three, three boxes. This is the autonomic ladder. So you want to just take a moment, check in with your body at this moment. And down at the bottom corner here, you can just put the time And so again, just tune into your nervous system, get a sense of the energy, and just put a dot where you think your nervous system is at this moment. Now for some of you, this is gonna be difficult. For those of you who are not in your bodies or live in your heads, you're gonna have a hard time perceiving the energy, but just make your best guess where you think you are. And this is a sample one this is a really good tool to use to practice developing this, it's, this awareness, this ability to tune in and perceive your nervous system. This is a critical part about becoming more embodied, more in your body, becoming more aware. So again, the skill is notice and name, learning to notice the energy in your nervous system and perceive the state. And throughout my bit of time that I'm talking with you folks, I'm gonna invite you every once in a while to just check in. Take a moment, pause, tune into your nervous system, notice what the energy is, what the state is, what you perceive, and then just make a notation. Now a short nine minute video about the autonomic nervous system. Half of us have a chronic disorder such as high blood pressure or autoimmune disease. Rates of anxiety, depression, PTSD, and addiction are skyrocketing. Why? The roots of these issues and more can often be traced to trauma, adverse childhood experiences, chronic stress, and ultimately, nervous system dysregulation. Meet your autonomic nervous system. Let's call it ANS. ANS takes care of a lot of your automatic functions like your heartbeat, digestion, and body temperature. ANS also manages your survival and stress response, working to keep you alive when your life is in danger. ANS functions as our built-in detection system, constantly scanning our environment for cues of safety and cues of danger. As ANS scans the environment, it has three general responses or states. Safe, you feel calm, relaxed, and connected to those around you. Mobilized, 
When ANDS detects danger, it sends a command and your heart rate and breathing increase, adrenaline and cortisol are released, and blood rushes to your muscles so you can handle the threat. This is our fight-flight response, immobilized. When ANDS detects that the danger is so great that you can't fight or run, it shuts you down. In this state, our heart rate, blood pressure, and body temperature decrease, and pain-numbing endorphins are released. ANDS does all of this automatically without us thinking about it. ANDS doesn't just use these states for survival. It uses them to navigate through the world each day. When ANDS functions well, it moves fluidly from one state to another, one minute mobilized and ready for action, and the next resting and recovering. ANDS will often blend states together. When we play, ANDS combines the mobilized and safe states. And when we are intimate with loved ones, it combines immobilized and safe states. When ANDS can stay flexible and fluid like this, it helps us manage and become resilient to stress and negative events. We're able to bounce back and move on. Unfortunately, when we experience trauma and chronic stress, it can keep ANDS from functioning in a healthy, regulated, and resilient way and can keep us stuck in states of survival. A friendly get-together can become frightening. A simple meeting at work can become threatening. For those with a history of trauma and chronic stress, the ANDS detection system often becomes faulty, constantly signaling danger even when we are safe. It's like ANDS is an alarm system, constantly signaling fire even when there's no smoke and no flames. Consistently living in these survival states can be debilitating, and we often develop adaptive strategies like using drugs, alcohol, food, work, or sex in an attempt to bring regulation and temporary relief. Understanding how trauma impacts us is critically important. There is a whole spectrum of experiences that can be traumatizing and adversely impact ANDS, like accidents, assaults, and natural disasters, which are often called shock traumas. There is also developmental or relational trauma, when we experience chronic adversity, abuse, neglect, and lack of safety while growing up. Many other experiences can be traumatizing, including chronic stress, medical procedures, and adverse community environments like poverty, discrimination, and violence. Additionally, new research in epigenetics shows us that trauma can get passed down genetically at least three generations. In the past, we've thought about trauma as events that happened to us. We now know that trauma is an experience, not an event. It's what happens inside of us as a result of what happens to us. It's our response to the event rather than the event itself. Over 20 years ago, Kaiser and the CDC launched a groundbreaking study of over 17,000 patients that showed a direct link between adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, and long-term health and wellness. In the study, two-thirds of participants reported at least one ACE. Over 20% reported three or more. When participants reported four or more ACEs, this corresponded to an increased chance for heart disease, cancer, drug abuse, and more. With six or more ACEs, life expectancy decreases by almost 20 years. We are learning that many physical and emotional symptoms may emerge from a chronically dysregulated ANDS. When ANDS get stuck in survival states, our biology shifts its focus from the tasks that keep us healthy, happy, and thriving to surviving the immediate perceived threat. Many conditions and symptoms that are chronic and difficult to diagnose and treat can be attributed to a dysfunctional ANDS. Our childhood experiences can also keep us from connecting with others. This is vitally important because as children, our number one survival priority is to attach to caregivers. When the people responsible for our safety aren't safe and we are living in chronic states of unsafety, ANDS doesn't get wired right. The part of ANDS that judges what is safe and what is not becomes faulty. If intimacy and connection were unsafe as a child, as adults, we'll often unconsciously reject attempts from friends and partners to connect. Even though intimacy and connection is what we want, ANDS feels it's unsafe and won't allow it. Trauma compromises our ability to engage with others, replacing the need for connection with the need for protection. When there has been trauma, ANDS can no longer differentiate between our unsafe past 
and our now safe present. Ands can't turn off the need to protect, even though we are now safe. So what can we do when ands becomes dysregulated? How do we recover from trauma and develop a healthy, regulated, resilient nervous system? Fortunately, we can retrain ands to feel safe again. This is best done with the help of others. Each one of us has an ands, and our ands is constantly communicating with and attuning to the states of others. We autonomically mirror the states of those around us. This is called co-regulating. We see it in herd behavior. If one animal senses danger, the entire group becomes more alert, increasing their chances of survival. We're exactly the same. When we're with others who are stressed, angry, or depressed, it makes us feel worse. When we're with others who are calm and happy, it makes us feel better. Connecting with others who are safe, attuned, and present is the best way to restore a healthy ANS. For those struggling to recover from the impacts of trauma, there is an emerging field of innovative clinical therapies that have been developed to reestablish safety and regulation to ANS. We're also learning that many of the activities we intuitively know make us feel better, like spending time in nature, practicing yoga, dancing, helping others, and more, can help ANS become more regulated and resilient. Healing from trauma and finding release from being stuck living in survival states comes as ANS becomes regulated, increases its capacity for resilience, and regains its flexibility. It's not about being calm all the time or mobilized all the time. It's about having a flexible and resilient nervous system that can accurately assess safety and danger and responds appropriately. We're truly resilient when we can fluidly move from one state to another. For those living with the impacts of trauma and chronic stress, becoming unstuck is like beginning a new life. For the rest of us, understanding how our nervous system states guide our behavior can help us become happier, healthier, and more empathetic human beings. Collectively, we have an epidemic of social issues that are rooted in trauma. If we can do the work to heal past traumas and build healthy, regulated nervous systems as individuals, families, and communities, we can end the cycles that continue to reinforce our greatest challenges and create a safer, vibrant, and more connected world. That video is available online. One of the resources or references I uh, gave in my information was the Polyvagal Institute. There's a bunch of great videos available there. So again, what I'd said earlier, we are biologically wired to connect. It is a biological imperative for survival. But we have this constant tension inside of us because we also are biologically wired for survival and for safety and self-protection. So we are longing to connect, but we have a drive to survive. And our nervous system is constantly evaluating to determine, is it safe enough to connect? And, there, and for those of us that are traumatized, living in the kind of world we're living in, we are repeatedly driven more towards survival than connection. And the lack of connection is contributing majorly to the lack of mental health in our world and impeding our own recoveries. So we're going to connect to something, whether it's a volleyball or another person, we're going to connect. Because again, it's a biological imperative. Stephen Porges, who developed the polyvagal theory, which is where this work comes from, says that trauma is a chronic disruption of connection. It is many things, but it is also that. It impacts our ability to connect to each other, to perceive safety with each other, and to engage with each other. So the polyvagal theory is about the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the longest nerve system in the body, and it evolved over millions and millions of years. It makes up the majority of our autonomic nervous system. And it is 
connected to all of these parts of our body. So when our autonomic nervous system is having difficulties, is ill-tuned, is traumatized, all of these get affected. So we have loads of illnesses and diseases that can be related to an ill-tuned nervous system, a dysregulated nervous system, a chronically stressed nervous system, a traumatized nervous system. So let me talk about the development of the, polyva of the vagus nerve. So again, the vagus nerve developed over millions and millions and millions of years. It's a part of our nervous system that is constantly scanning, searching for cues of safety and cues of danger. 500 million years ago, when we were just evolving, all we had was the oldest part of our nervous system, which is called dorsal vagal. And that is the sh when, when we were threatened way back when, all we could do was shut down. It's like the tortoise pulling its head in the, in the shell. All we could do was shut down. It's a freeze state. It's a, it's a state of immobilization, no energy. You can't take any action. You want to disappear and go away. So it is a shutdown state. 400 million years ago, we developed the next branch of our autonomic nervous system, which is called the sympathetic nervous system. And most of you are familiar with that. That's the fight or flight response. So now, when we were threatened, instead of only being able to be immobilized and shut down and withdrawn, now we could take some action. We could fight or we could flee. It's a very mobilized state. It's loads of energy, very activated kind of state. And then 200 million years later, we developed the youngest, newest branch of our autonomic nervous system, the ventral branch, ventral vagal, which, is, which that down-regulates our nervous system. That is the social engagement system. So when you smile, when you connect, when you move towards another, when you connect to another, when you engage with another in a positive, good way, in a way that feels safe, that is the ventral vagal part of the nervous system that is calming the rest of the system. It's calming the sympathetic. It's keeping the dorsal part from, sh from shutting us down. Social engagement network, that part of the nervous system, is the face-heart connection. It's everything in our face and connects to our heart. And so it, it, it's, the, it's the pacemaker in our, in our system. The, what, we, we, what Deb Dana, so Stephen Poor just developed this theory Deb Dane is a clinician. She took this theory out of the lab and brought it into the clinical world, and it's now spreading more and more in the clinical world. It's just starting to come into the field of education a bit. It's sadly very little coming into the medical field, and yet it critically needs to come into the medical field. So we talk about the autonomic ladder, moving up and down the autonomic ladder. It used to be believed that our autonomic nervous system had two parts, parasympathetic and sympathetic, and they worked in opposition to each other. You got too much sympathetic, the parasympathetic brought it down. Too much parasympathetic, sympathetic brought it down or brought it up. Now what we know is there are three branches, and we move up and down this autonomic ladder predictably. So when I feel, so the, uh, when, I, when my nervous system perceives safety, when it perceives more cues of safety than danger, I open up and I move towards. When it perceives more cues of danger than safety, I pull back, I get activated into a sympathetic nervous system state of fight or flight, and if I can't resolve the perceived threat, real or imagined, drop down into a dorsal state. And we move, a flexible nervous system moves up and down this ladder all day responding resiliently, flexibly to, to situations as they come at us. And I want to talk about safety and danger for a minute. When we talk about cues of danger, we're talking about the nervous system's perspective. Okay, we are not talking about left, logical, reasonable brain. And we're not talking about a gun to the head or, or someone threatening your, your life. We're talking about what your nervous system perceives, which is very different often than what your left brain perceives. We're talking about what your nervous system perceives 
as a cue of danger. So as an example, I grew up in a home where there was a fair bit of violence. My father raged. <clears throat> My mother wasn't really around to regulate him or regulate me. I grew up in trouble a lot, a lot of attention deficit issues. So I grew up frequently in trouble. And I have this part in my nervous system that it perceives trouble. It's like, uh-oh. And my nervous system gets activated. So 10, 15 minutes ago, Celia's doing her thing, and I'm operating on the wrong schedule. I think we're doing 45 minutes each. So we've agreed to keep each other on track with time. So I show her papers <laughs> with the wrong time. And I completely throw her off. I mean, she does a beautiful job. And she comes down and finishes and goes off. And, and I realize, like, oh, God, I'm operating on an old schedule. I messed her thing up. Instantly, cue of danger to my nervous system. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And, and, and that, so while the video's going on, I'm regulating my nervous system in calm. I perceive a rupture in the relationship. A cue of danger, sympathetic activation starts flowing into my nervous system. Now, I'm not flipping out. I'm not going out and getting drunk. I'm not in a fight. But I can feel the charge. I start moving down the autonomic ladder inside. I can feel that energy. Celia comes back in. I go over. We have a few words. I apologize. We talk about a shift we can do this afternoon. I do a, what, what feels to me like a repair my nervous system begins to settle. The cue of danger is resolved. Now there's more of a cue of safety. I move back up the autonomic ladder. I can still feel the energy in my system, but it's not the same as it was. So we're talking about cues of danger from the nervous system's perspective and cues of safety from the nervous system's perspective. My left brain says, you know, we've known each other a really long time. She knows I didn't do it on purpose. We'll be fine. That's my left brain. My body's like, ooh, uh-oh. And, and so, and that will take over. So let me go into more about our nervous system. With each state, and this is the autonomic ladder, this is ventral, this is sympathetic, and this is dorsal. As we move up and down the ladder into in and out of different states, there are different emergent qualities that come with each one of these states. There are things that I, you will see in ventral, qualities you will see in ventral, that you won't see in sympathetic, and you won't see in dorsal, and vice versa. So some of the emergent properties or emergent qualities of ventral state are co-regulation, that I am able to engage with another nervous system and help regulate that nervous system when it's dysregulated. Those of you who do traffic stops or respond to domestic violence situations or any kind of conflict or have a five-year-old or have a spouse, those nervous systems get activated. And the more you can settle, regulate your own nervous system, you can bring co-regulating energy to that nervous system and you calm and settle that nervous system. I have to be in ventral for me to co-regulate another nervous system. Also, I'm able to self-regulate when I have more ventral energy in my system, when that part of my system is more activated. <clears throat> I can connect to self, others, the world, and spirit. That part of my system is online, and it enables me to engage with others. The social engagement system is kicked into gear, and it enables me to connect and engage in relationship. I can tune into the moment. I can be present. I can control where my awareness and my attention goes. I can tune out distractions. I'm resourced. I have enough resources and, and abilities on board to do what I need to do to respond to whatever situation's in front of me. I can reach out for support. I can offer support. <clears throat> I can get, accept support. I can explore options. So a part of the brain that Celia talked about was the central executive network. That part of our brain that generates possibility and options and decisions and planning and problem solving and all of that 
I have to have a degree of ventral energy on board for those higher executive functions to work. So I can explore options. I can have hope. I can feel compassion. I can feel compassion for myself and for other people. I can be much more flexible and resilient when I have ventral energy on board or when my nervous system is adequately tuned. And it promotes health and recovery. You have to have enough ventral energy for your organs and body to be able to settle, to be able to get healthy. And it creates a story of possibility. The stories change based on what state I'm in. So it creates a story of possibility. So now to move down the ladder a little bit. The emergent properties of the sympathetic nervous system are a sense of unease and impending danger. Mobilization of fight or flight response of aggression or escape, alarmed, hypervigilance, anxiety, worry, fear, all of that is, you know, is, is very, loads energy, loads of energy in those kinds of states. Panic attacks is a very sympathetically charged state. I can look and listen, I, I wind up in sympathetic looking and listening for danger. So I get hyper-focused on searching for cues of danger that I perceive. Again, real or imagined. I miss and I misread signs of safety. So there might be signs of safety around me, but my nervous system can't per perceive them because I'm only, I'm looking like through glasses that are just saying threat, 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 threat. And there might not be a threat or there might be some source of safety in there and I can't pick it up. I can't perceive it. A sense of separation and being cut off from other people disconnected from self, others, world, and spirit. And the story that I tell myself in that state is, this is an unsafe world and everybody is unsafe. And then I say really bad things about me. Because we tell ourselves stories about ourselves, other people, and the world. And now the emergent qualities of dorsal, the body enters into a conservation mode, like a shutdown. It is a shutdown mode. You can be numb, foggy, collapsed, withdrawn, disconnected, untethered, just sort of a sense of floating and not really being grounded or present, alone, lost, abandoned, unreachable, hopeless, you disappear. You just, a sense of not being there. And safety and hope feel unreachable. And the story in that state is a story of despair. So just to look a little bit how it works, okay, because it's, it it's hierarchical, it moves up and down. Hopefully you can see that adequately. So when the, paras when the ventral vagal is online, its job is to regulate these two in the background. When it's active enough to do its job, it is, it is regulating the sympathetic nervous system and it's, and it's regulating dorsal. When ventral's on board, you navigate the world with a sense of safety and flexibility, or let's say more safe than not safe. You explore options. Again, when you're in ventral, we are automatically open up and move towards. We are wired to engage others and engage the world. So if I feel safe enough, my nervous system will move towards and will open up. I see possibilities. I can connect and create. The sympathetic system with ventral running it regulates the blood flow and heart rate, energize enough, it brings enough energy to meet the demands of the day. I can get mobilized in play. I can engage with others. I can move more, I can move with passion through the world. And my, my dorsal state regulated by ventral provide, it goes through the process of rest, digest, rest, digest and restore. That's where recovery happens, is when, is when ventral's on board, I'm safe enough, but dorsal can operate in the background and, and do rest, digestion and healing. When ventral goes offline, we drop down the autonomic ladder and now sympathetic kicks into gear. When sympathetic is in, in the foreground, when the primary energy running the system is sympathetic, you have an experience and a sense of unease, 
you lose your cognitive abilities. So again, those higher executive, the central executive network begins to go offline. We get irrational. You, you can't talk reasonableness to someone whose ventral vagal is offline and, and they're, they're act, truly activated into a sympathetic state. Um, we move out of social engagement, so we disconnect. If I don't have ventral on board, you have become a danger. I am now in one of my protective or defensive states, either the sympathetic or dorsal, they're protective defensive states. I can't connect to you. You're a danger. <clears throat> we mobilize for fight or flight. We may enter into the deer in the headlights kind of freeze, and we feel the effects of the cortisol and, and adrenaline. So the HPA access gets kicked into gear, the hypo, HP, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal, right? access, which is the fight or flight, takes over, and now, we're, now the chemicals are running the show, and we are responding to a danger, and we're not thinking really clear necessarily. And the dorsal part of the system, digestion is out of balance. One of the things we see a lot with trauma survivors who are not treated is loads of stomach issues. Digestion gets totally thrown off when you have a ill-tuned, dysregulated nervous system. So when dorsal system, when, if I can't resolve the threat, again, real or imagined, if I can't resolve it in sympathetic, if I resolve it, I move back up into ventral. If I don't resolve it and it remains long enough, I'm going to drop down into a dorsal state. And when dorsal is running the system, that's the predominant part of the system running, you zone out, you shut down, dissociate, disappear. You have freeze, not the active freeze deer in the headlights, it's freeze collapse. You just drop, either figuratively or literally drop inside. And you suffer with the digestive problems. So people, when they're learning this stuff, um, initially we just teach those three states. And then people struggle and go, well, I'm not really fully this and I'm not really that. There are also three blended states. So ventral and sympathetic, so you feel safe, you're engaged, and you got loads of energy. It's a state of play. Any of you who dance or do anything that you're really jazzed about, you know, that like, ooh, I am digging on this, watching a football game that you're really loving or something like, this is wicked cool. You are in a blended ventral sympathetic state, loads of energy, you're active, you're moving, you're safe, and you're regulated, but you are loads of big energy. Ventral and dorsal is a really difficult state for a lot of trauma survivors to get into. Ventral and dorsal is a state of stillness and quiet and silence. I'm calm, I'm safe, I'm connected, my energies are present, maybe sitting on the porch, looking out at the sunset, just hanging and chilling. That's a state of sympathetic, of ventral and dorsal. Safely still is what we call it. And then the state of, the last blended state of sympathetic and dorsal, that's deer in the headlights. I am frozen and cannot move, paralyzed with fear, but inside of me, if you hooked me up to a heart monitor, like freaking out. Does that make sense? So those are the blended states. So there's a process that a term called neuroception, which Stephen Porges coined. It's perception without awareness. This process, so neuroception is where we scan the environment. I scan, we scan in our bodies, we scan between us, relationships, and we scan the world searching for cues of safety and cues of danger. And all of this is unconscious. And if my neuroception perceives more cues of safety than danger, I activate, it activates ventral, I open up, I engage, I'm more regulated than not. If it perceives, again, unconsciously, more cues of danger than safety, I drop down into sympathetic, and then I may drop down into dorsal from there. 
all unconscious. It can get triggered by thoughts in my head, or so in, in the, the little dust up in my own mind of the schedule thing, my chest tightened, and that's how I felt as a kid. That's old trauma in my nervous system. My nervous system perceived a threat, and then my mind starts going. And so this was a cue of danger inside my own body that my nervous system picked up. <clears throat> I don't often say this publicly, especially not these days, but I'm Jewish. And with the attack on Israel and what's happening on our college campuses and with the explicit anti-Semitism that's just coming right up to the surface, environmentally, pretty significant cues of danger in my world, in my life. So we search for, for cues of safety or danger within our bodies, between us, and in the world. Story follows state. This is such an important concept. We are narrative creatures. We are narrative beings. We are constantly, our, our brain, one of the things it is, is a meaning-making machine. Its job is to make sense of whatever's happening. Whatever's happening inside of me, between us, and out here, because for my survival, I need to get it. I need to understand. There are three things that all nervous systems need. They need context, which is information. So you talked about us as civilians watching the news. We don't have information. We don't know what's going on. We don't know where this person might be. We don't know what, you, what some of you would know. <clears throat> so we need context. We also need choice. Nervous systems need choice. One of the traumatizing aspects of child physical abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, all that, there's no choice. No one asked, can we do this? Are you okay if I beat your mother in front of you? Do you mind? There is no choice. So nervous systems need choice to feel safe, and they need connection. So our meaning-making machine, our brain, is constantly telling ourselves a story. And that story is determined by what state I'm in. So whatever physiological state I'm in, it will create a psychological story. So in, a, in ventral, my, my story is that I'm okay. I'm more okay than not. We're okay. Nobody jumped up and yelled al-Akbar when I said I was Jewish. I'm like, okay, check that off the list. And, and the world in ventral, as freaking nuts as it all is, it's, there's hope. It's an okay place. Like, you're all here learning stuff. If this craziness wasn't happening in Maine right now in Lewiston, there'd been a whole lot more people here learning stuff. And hopefully they'll watch these videos and learn more. There's hope. In Ventral, the story is that I'm okay, you're okay, title for a book, and the world's basically okay. In Sympathetic, when I drop down out of, the, out of Ventral, I drop down into, door, into Sympathetic, the story changes. We are not okay. Celia's pissed at me. We're going to have a problem later. <laughs> I am such a jerk because I did that. What a fucking moron. <clears throat> and it messed this up for you guys. In dorsal, which I, is not where my nervous system goes very much, it's more hopeless. It's like, oh, man, you just blew it all. You just ruined it all. You should just walk away and die. That's the story in dorsal. If in five minutes or two minutes, I walk over and repair with Celia, which really, we're fine. If I walk over and repair with Celia, I move back up the ladder. And within minutes, the story changes. Most of us think that the story we're telling ourselves is truth. Most of us believe that chatter that we're saying up here. And what we need to know is 
that that story is generated by a state. And if I change that state, that story changes. My truth, my reality, my perception shifts. It's such a critical concept. So home away from home. In polyvagal language, home is ventral. This is where our nervous system wants to be. It wants to feel safe. It wants to feel connected. It wants to feel regulated. It wants to feel engaged. It's where it wants to be. All of us grow up in different ways, and our nervous systems adapt to our environments, to our childhoods, to our homes, to our families, by developing a, a default mode. So my default mode, where my nervous system goes when I am not in ventral, is it drops into sympathetic. It drops into a fight or flight state. Get anxious. I grew up terrified till about 12 or 13. And then when the hormones and the testosterone kicked in, my nervous system discovered anger. I was like, whoa, this works a whole lot better than fear. And so my nervous system got reinforced with being in a chronically angry state which at least was better and more adaptive to my system than being scared all the time. But that's my home away from home. I have loads of pathways in my nervous system that can drop me quickly into a sympathetic state. My wife's home away from home is dorsal. She grew up in a really violent home, and it was safest to keep her head down, take care of her siblings, cause no trouble, just be quiet, kind of disappear. So her state goes into dorsal. She comes out of ventral, does a little brief stop in dorsal, in sympathetic, just enough to be pissed off, and then drops down into dorsal, which makes for interesting conflicts, because I'm all spun up and sympathetic, and she's collapsed and disappeared. We've been together a really long time, and so we've figured it out. We all have a home away from home. So if you take a moment and think about you and your life in your nervous system, and when you are under stress, not like a little oop, but I mean stress, where does your, what's your home away from home? Is it sympathetic or is it dorsal? And you just want to get familiar. This is, all of this is about learning to befriend, to come to know your own nervous system. So I want to invite you again to take a moment. Oops. And just take out your sheet and just check in with your nervous system and just get a sense. What's the sense of the energy in your nervous system? Deb Dana uses a ladder to represent the autonomic ladder. And the rungs indicate that there's all these flavors. There's flavors of ventral and flavors of sympathetic and flavors of dorsal. So you want to tune in and be able to perceive your own state. The autonomic impact of trauma. Trauma sidetracks the development of autonomic regulation. One of the most important outcomes of childhood development, of rearing children, is, the is helping them develop the ability to regulate their own nervous systems, to self-regulate. Many, much of the problems that people experience in our society is not due to intellect. It isn't, we don't have, it isn't because people are stupid. It's because people are dysregulated and they can't regulate their nervous systems. So one of the most important things for raising children is to have them develop the ability to regulate their own nervous systems. Trauma sidetracks that. Trauma, traumatic experiences interrupt opportunities to exercise the neural circuitry of connection. Ventral, I need ventral energy to be able to connect and engage. If I grow up as I did in an overwhelming, scary, angry, traumatizing environment, sympathetic gut exercised a whole lot. That part of my nervous system, what we stimulate gets stronger. That part got really strong. Ventral didn't get really strong. I didn't learn how to do relationships, how to connect, how to be present, how to self-regulate. I definitely learned how to defend and run away and, and not be connected. So it sidetracks the opportunity to exercise the neural circuitry of connection. Trauma replaces patterns of connection with patterns of protection. 
So people's default becomes being stuck in these protective modes, these protective states. And adaptive survival responses replace social engagement. So again, if I don't adequately have ventral exercised on board, my adaptations to my world are always to be in a state of defense, state of disconnection, state of on guard, of alertness. <clears throat> and trauma impacts that co-regulation is unavailable and dangerous. I, I, can't, I couldn't accept co-regulation from anyone else. It wasn't available to me, but I also couldn't provide it. I couldn't co-regulate anybody else. And then self-regulation is ineffective and inadequate. So <clears throat> I grew up in, um, after rage came drugs. And so I was a drug addict for a long time. That worked to settle my nervous system the only way I knew how. I hadn't developed any other more effective ways to regulate my nervous system than other, other than that. And it worked. Caused all kinds of other problems, but it worked. So this is from Gabor Mate. If any of you are uh, familiar with him or not familiar with him, he's someone definitely you want to look at his work, Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E. He's a specialist in trauma and in addictions. He's a physician. Our bodies forget nothing. Every fear, every memory, every joy, every trauma you've ever experienced can be traced back in your body. Your body remembers the stories your brain has forgotten. Every single experience that we have is stored in here. The sensory parts of it, what I heard, smelled, felt, what the vibration was, all of that gets stored into my body. And with traumatic experience, it gets trapped until I can adequately, through co-regulation with another, tolerate remembering and feeling and then be able to move through it. We'll talk more about that after the break. <clears throat> Risks connected to rigid nervous systems, to autonomic rigidity. Hypervigilance, chronically head on a swivel and not able to stop when you're not in threatening environments. Vigilance for angry faces. Distractions from tasks to potential threats. So I can't control my attentional system. I can't say, it, it's fine. There's nothing over there to worry about. I can't direct those executive function skills. Inability to discern trivial from important cues. Again, that's an executive function skill. Heightened startle response. Hypoactive prefrontal regulation. So my prefrontal lobe, my medial prefrontal cortex, this part, its job, when it's working well, it regulates my body. It down-regulates when it's too activated. That is in a hypoactive, meaning it's not active enough. It's not working enough to settle because it's gone offline. Social isolation and loneliness, impaired immune functions, digestive problems, respiratory problems, chronic fatigue, anxiety, depression, addictions. <clears throat> Dysautonomia is a name that's given to illnesses. It uh, refers to a group of medical conditions caused by problems with the autonomic nervous system. So one of the difficulties, one of the many difficulties these days with our medical industry, and it has definitely become the medical industrial complex, one of the problems is that they focus on end organ disease. So they look at these illnesses and they go, oh yeah, your kidney. But they don't go upstream to see what could be causing this thing in your kidney. So I not long ago was diagnosed supposedly with prediabetes. And, and here's the treatment. This is what we do. Medicine, of course. Not looking at any of the underlying things that could be causing that besides diet and exercise or in addition to a diet and exercise. So I go to a functional medicine physician who looks at the whole of my body and determines this, this, and this are contributing to it. We're going to take care of this, this, and this. Prediabetes is gone. Medical industry would have had me on meds forever. Dysautonomia are all these illnesses that can be, are connected to, either directly or indirectly, to a chronically dysregulated or traumatized autonomic nervous system. So the good news, our brains and bodies change 
literally to the moment we die. People didn't want me to say that about the moment we die, but it's true. Our systems change with experience, and they will change right up until the moment that there is no more change. So we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we're going to come back and talk about treatment of trauma and health and recovery.